Welcome everyone. I'm Nina Collins from Revel. Revel is an online platform, a social platform for women over 40. We offer events and community. Um, a friend of mine recently called us Meetup for the Middle Age, which I thought was kind of fabulous. We have 13,000 members. It's a startup. We run more than 100 virtual and in-person events per week, a number which will only grow as we climb out of COVID. So all sorts of events like book clubs and hikes and um, events like this where we talk about financial care. Um, we have 75 unique hosts a week. We also have groups like on Facebook, so you can join according to your interests, like a Chicago group or a financial group or a book club group. Um, and we have 50 of those groups and climbing also. We, we create new groups as members come up with the ideas. So there's a come sew with me group and a dog moms group and um, you know groups where you can talk about sex. So we, we have all sorts of groups where you can talk about all sorts of wonderful things. Yes, I will post Revel's info in the chat for sure. Um, a few more fun facts about us. This surprised me. We've had 6,500 total signups for events in January so far, and it's only January 12th. So Revel is really growing, and we are a place for a certain kind of fabulous woman um, over 40, even though Britt, our special guest today, is only 34. She's welcome because we want expertise from all women. Um, and oh, I, I did a quick perusal because we're here for an event on financial self-care. I did a quick perusal before we logged on today um, to see what other financial events we have on Revel. And we have many, we have a bunch of investment clubs. We have a meeting for the Bitcoin curious. We have a monthly money talk. Um, and again, you can come on as a member and create your own event. So it's a real mix of events by experts, events by members of the community, et cetera. So today for our event, our event is called Financial Self-Care with Britt Williams Baker. Britt is the co-founder of Dow Janes. She went to Harvard Business School with the co-founders of Revel actually. Um, she's gonna be teaching us today about financial self-care. And at the end, she'll tell us a bit about her program which is called the Million Dollar Year Program. She's offering Revelers a very generous discount and I'm psyched to learn all the details. Um, and basically she's, you know, her bio says she's a Harvard Business School graduate with a penchant for personal finance and a knack for keeping things fun. Britt started investing at the age of eight and has been making saving and investing easy for anyone to understand for her entire life, it sounds like, and I'm psyched to learn. So welcome, Britt. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Nina. It's really fun to be here. Um, and thank you all for sharing where you're from in the chat. So I will just introduce myself a bit more fully, which is I'm Britt Baker, co-founder of Dow Janes, and Dow Janes is a company focused on the financial education and empowerment of people who identify as women. Um, and I would love to get to know you. So if you haven't already told me, let me know in the chat where you are joining from and what inspired you to join today? What was your motivation? <clears throat> so what is Dow Janes? It's a financial education and empowerment business. We exist to get more money in the hands of more women. And there's really nothing that excites us more than getting people out of debt, having people learn to invest for the first time, having people feel confident about their financial situation. So if you like what you learned today, you can find us on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, and we offer a ton of free content in all of those different platforms. Uh, so who am I and why am I here teaching this content today? So the truth is I am a huge nerd when it comes to personal finance. My dad taught me about compound interest at the age of eight. My grandfather taught me how to invest in stocks when I was in college. And I've always obsessively saved and invested my money enough so that I bought my house in cash before I was 30. But I was lucky, <laughs> Nina, jaw drop. <laughs> You know, I was lucky. I had great money role models growing up. My parents taught me about personal finance. My mom was really great about teaching us the value of a dollar. And my dad had this thing called the daddy bank where we, he really incentivized us to save our money. Uh, but not everyone gets that. In fact, most people don't get that. We don't get this in school. A lot of people don't get it from their parents. Uh, it's just a real missing piece in the world. And so, you know, when I graduated from Harvard Business School and moved back out to the Bay Area, I had friends asking about investing all the time. It's like, you know, we didn't learn this in school and they just wanted to know, I'm supposed to be investing, how do I do it? So I started a club and taught them in my living room exactly what they needed to know, like the steps that were required. But I realized in that meeting, in those meetings, that people weren't actually ready to invest. So a lot of people have this idea of like, I should be investing, I want to invest. 
but there's a bunch of steps that are required before you're actually ready to invest. Like saving, like having an emergency savings fund, learning how to budget, having the financial habits in place first. So at that point, I teamed up with my best friend and now business partner, Lorianne King. And together we created a program that bridges the gap of what's missing when it comes to personal finance education. Uh, if you think about it, the financial industry was created by men for men. And we thought there has to be a better way, a more inclusive way, a more supportive way. So we bring a practical and holistic approach to your finances, which we're going to get into the holistic piece today. Uh, we start by addressing your relationship to money. So we all have stories and beliefs and assumptions when it comes to money. They're all ingrained in us. Usually they're inherited from the people who raised us. Um, and so getting really clear on what our stories are is, a, you know, it's where you have to start and you have to start in the beginning. And then we bring in a pleasurable and mindfulness weekly money ritual. That's what we're going to talk about today of how you actually take care of your finances. Then, of course, there's the practical piece of really focusing on what are the steps necessary to build a financial foundation, feel confident financially, and be prepared for retirement. So um, all of that, as we talked about, Nina, when we just started is, you know, the importance of spending and investing in alignment with your values. So this is a piece that's often overlooked in most financial education. It's like, don't buy that latte or don't spend money on that colonoscopy that's more, you know, at, the, at a beautiful doctor's office. <laughs> really, you know, really it's about choice. It's, you know, are you choosing to spend your money in these ways and are you doing it consciously? And can you afford it because you've looked at it, you know, in with the rest of your budget, but really bringing agency and choice to spending decisions. Um, so, you know, ultimately this really doesn't come down to money. For me, money is a means to an end. It gives me the freedom and the choice to live the life I want. So this is me and my husband and our adventure van or hiking and mountain biking. And money matters to me because of the quality of life that it can provide. And that's what I want for everyone. I want you to live the life that you deserve to live without having to stress about money. And so I'm curious, and I want to know in the chat, if you had all the money that you needed and you didn't have to stress about money anymore, what would you do? Would you travel? Would you spend time with family? What are the things that just really kind of light you up if you didn't have to spend your time you know, working or earning money? Travel, yeah, travel, 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 travel with kids. I travel constantly. <laughs> all right, we nailed it with travel. Everyone here wants to travel. <laughs> Half a year in Connecticut, half a year in Italy. Yes, weekly massages, make art, experience life, time with grandkids. Yeah, yes, that's start what I want. A, start a farm. I love start a farm. Start a farm, get a bunch of puppies, <laughs> teach my kids about compounding interests. Shay, that is so good. Pampering, art, self-care. Yes, okay. So I want those things for all of you, and I don't want finances to be holding you back from living that life. So you know, more than anything, I care about financial empowerment, being you being able to live the life that you want, the choice to you know, make whatever decisions that you want. Um, and while you know, financial empowerment begins with education, that's you know, foundational, that's the first piece of it. There's a requirement of the right money mindset and habits. And that's what we're going to dig into today because it's a, it's a missing piece that people don't think about. They think, I just need to you know, learn the skills, learn how to budget. But if you don't have the right mindset going into it, nothing will stick. Okay, so my hope is that by the end of this session, you will actually look forward to taking care of your finances and be on your way towards having a healthy and positive relationship with money. How does that sound? Good. Cool. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a lot. So if you remember 20% of it, consider that a win. Um, feel free to take notes and, you know, turn off your cell phones, stay distraction free. You'll get the most out of this if you're really present. And if you stick around to the end, as Nina mentioned, I'm going to be giving you both a free checklist um, and a, a simple action step to take with you as you as you leave today. So you really have a, a takeaway. Okay. Uh, so to set the stage, let's start with a simple fact, which is unfortunately women do not build wealth at the same rate as men. Why is that? There's a lot of nuances, uh, but there's four major influences. So uh, the first is that we're paid less. You know, we all know this. Women are paid 23% less than men. It's even worse for Black and Latinx populations. So from out of the gate, we're starting from further behind. 
We also are less likely to negotiate. 40% of women let their spouse make long-term financial decisions, even if they're the primary breadwinner. And we give away our power. You know, we don't negotiate in our first jobs, and that just means that we earn less over time. We're also charged more for the same things. This one makes me irate. <laughs> That's called the pink tax. So if you think of something like razors, women pay more for razors than men. It's it's absurd. So you know we're paying more and we're earning less, and it just it means we're further behind. We're also charged a higher interest rate on loans, even though we're less likely to default. And then finally, we're less likely to be given a financial education. This has um, been shown that parents are more likely to talk to their sons about money than their daughters. And women in general, you know, we feel like it's taboo to talk about money. And so we, you know, women often learn from each other, but with, when a topic is seen as taboo, we don't, uh, we don't go there. So we aren't even given the chance to learn these things to be able to catch up. The impacts of this are that women are five times more likely than men to live paycheck to paycheck. We invest later and less often in life, even though we're better investors. And we're twice as likely to be in poverty when we retire. That one is most upsetting. And this one I see a lot. We just posted a YouTube video this week about if you're you know, 45 and haven't thought about retirement yet, which is the case for so many people. Um, so this is one that I'm really you know, out to shift. The result of this is that it has, it has left a lot of women in survival mode when it comes to money. You know, we're just trying to get by, you know, make it to the next month. And I just want to come out and say that it's not your fault. You know, there have been external forces working against us financially for a long time. You know, we weren't taught how to fight back against these forces. So if you feel any shame or anxiety or fear or helplessness when it comes to money, just know that you're not alone and it's not your fault. You know, we haven't been given a seat at the money table. This is systemic and it's important to acknowledge as context, not that that's, you know, an excuse for staying behind, but just helpful to know, you know, where we're starting from. And, um, you know, we only recently, it was like in this last few decades that we were able to open bank accounts in our own names without a, a male counterpart or get credit cards as women. So, you know, this, all this stuff is new. Um, and if this doesn't describe you, if you're like, no, I, you know, I was given an education and I've got my seat at the money table, that's awesome. And I want you to know that, you know, I had that too growing up and we are the minority. That is not the norm. I mean, you know, most people aren't given this education. So today, women more than any time before have more financial potential and mobility than any other time in history. So this is what I was mentioning with, you know, we can get credit in our own names. We can't legally get fired for being pregnant anymore. <laughs> you know, that's outrageous. Um, but the problem is, you know, our financial education hasn't caught up to our opportunities. So we, you know, we have all these opportunities in front of us and now we just don't know how to take advantage of them. So we have a little work to do. And it's not just about the financial education, as I mentioned before. To deal with money financially, we need to deal with it emotionally. There's a piece, oh, sweet dog. Uh, everyone has their own story, their own relationship to money that they're coming in with. And you have to address that before we can address anything else. So I'm gonna start with a story. I just wanna share the story of two women. This is Hannah and Madison. And so Hannah and Madison are coworkers. They started at the same time. They went through company training together. They both earned $50,000 in their first year salary, and they've been working together for five years. And I just want to take you through what happened in each of their financial lives. So Hannah, um, she was given a standard raise of 5% each year because she didn't negotiate. So now she makes 60 k she tries not to spend too much, but she's you know just guessing. She covers a lot of things on her credit card. She doesn't talk or think about money, finds it stressful, finds the financial world intimidating and overwhelming, understandably. She would love to buy a house, but doesn't know how she'll save for a down payment. She uh, doesn't have much of an emergency savings and has uh, student debt and doesn't have any investments. So that's Hannah. This is Hannah the hopeful. That's the situation that you know, a lot of people end up in without a financial education. Madison, the maximizer on the other hand, she took a different approach when she joined the company. She asked for a raise. She got a 10% raise each year and now makes 75K. She has 
good habit. She budgets each month and tracks and reviews it weekly. She knows what she can spend on and achieve her goals. She loves feeling on top of her finances. She actually feels relaxed about money and enjoys it when she spends it. She will buy a house next year with her down payment that she saved. She has an emergency fund, paid off her student loans, and has investments growing at 7% each year. Now, you know, obviously these are hypothetical scenarios that I have exaggerated, but I'd, you know, I'd love to know of these two people, of Hannah and Madison, who do you most identify with right now? Who have you been more of in your life so far? I'd love to know in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Miss J, for just acknowledging that. Hannah, yeah. Some Madison, some in between. Yeah, hybrid, some Madisons in there. Yeah, a lot of Hannahs. Totally. And, you know, there's, there's zero judgment here at all with which, with who you've been, and, you know, as we talked about, most of us have never learned this. Yeah, Angelina, tears, as I identify with Hannah. Absolutely. Yeah, just, I just want to acknowledge you for, you know, showing up here today and you know, realizing that about your past and you, know, you have an opportunity to, to change that, you know, to become a Madison. So, you know, let's talk about why things, you know, why these are two different, such, such different scenarios, because it's not just about their income and it's not just about their financial education, although that is a bit part of it, but, you know, a big part of this is about their relationships to money. So they have really different relationships with money. And, you know, you might be thinking, you know, what is a money relationship? It is the way that you think, feel, and act towards money. Because money itself is neutral. It's, you know, it's just a paper, a medium of exchange. It was invented to make it easier to trade goods and services. There's actually no meaning behind it. We just give it meaning. Um, you know, for most people, it's laden with emotions. You know, what do you think about when, when you think about money? Do you think like, <clears throat> there's, there's usually a lot of stories that come with it too. Is it like money equals greed or money equals power or money equals opportunity? You know, what, what are the associations? What stories do you tell yourself about what money means? Because we often, you know, we, we add a whole lot of meaning to money. We add judgments, you know, what amount is good or bad, morality, what is good, right, or fair to do with your money. We assess our own self-worth as a function of our wealth. You know, there's so much more to our self-worth than money. And, you know, a level of success. We add our personal identity and whether or not we've been successful to money. And all of these things are, their stories and interpretations that we are telling ourselves about pieces of paper. Like it actually means something about us. And there's, you know, that's, that's totally normal. It's totally normal to have a complex thoughts about, you know, everything in life and money is just one of them. And I want to acknowledge that these beliefs are often inherited from our culture, reinforced by our parents and, you know, continually supported by our own personal experiences with money. There's a lot of different things that shape our relationship to money. I won't go into each of these, but I just want to acknowledge that um, no, I mean, I feel like checking my accounts in a panic now. Hold on, don't do that because there's an opportunity to really check your accounts in a different way. And we're going to get there. So stick with me. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, a lot of different pieces that shape our, shape our relationship to money. And again, it was largely inherited. So how you deal with money is a learned behavior. No one comes out of the womb knowing how to balance a bank account. Um, so give yourself a little break and there's, there's a new future ahead. So I just want to set, put this right out there from the beginning, which is mon your money situation and how you've dealt with it so far does not mean anything about you. Okay. And that's important to acknowledge because this next piece, your financial situation is a result of your relationship to money. Meaning if your relationship to money changes, your financial situation can also change. You know, you have the you've control over how this plays out for you. Uh, so the way that you think and feel and act, remember that's what your relationship to money is. It's how you think and feel and act towards money. Uh, that can shift. That can shift with new habits, with new mindsets, with new behaviors around money. <clears throat> and you know, what we've found in doing this work with over 4,000 women is that if you just go and try to change your financial results without doing the beginning part of addressing your relationship to money, 
it won't work. So you can't manage money financially until we sort through our emotional response to that and really separate money facts from money feelings. So, you know, an example of a money fact is I have $600 in my account. A money feeling is I'm broke. A money fact is I have $50,000 in debt. A money feeling is I'm drowning in debt and I'm never going to get out. So really, you know, putting a um, more of like a state of the world around your situation versus just acknowledging the facts. And, you know, this is really common to associate, to give much more meaning to the facts of the situation. We talk about this in our program a lot about just claiming the numbers. So rather than like hiding from the amount of debt, just saying like, I have $34,700 in debt. And having that be a fact, it doesn't mean anything about you. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. None of that. It's just the fact of the situation because of all of these factors that we've talked about today. So the other example I like to bring in here is talking about bananas. So if someone told you they had 10,000 bananas, <laughs> that wouldn't mean anything to you. It'd be like, oh, great, what are you going to do with them? Uh, versus, you know, I, I like owe someone three bananas. There's no meaning. And so trying to think about money as bananas, like there's, there doesn't have to be meaning around it. It doesn't have to mean anything about you. Um, that's, that's a choice that we have. Okay, so um, quick check in for the chat, which is how do you currently view taking care of your finances? I have a few options. You can also write your own. Is it, you know, you can't be bothered. It's like boring, annoying, or tedious. Is it anxiety producing? like a chore or necessary, yeah, Lorian. Um, or is it fun? Is it something you enjoy? So let me know in the chat how you view taking care of your finances right now. Super stressful, so I ignore it. Yes, scary, a chore, fun in a way for Amanda. Anxiety inducing, like a chore, chore. It's as fun as going to the dentist. <laughs> Tedious chore, but fun. Anxiety, stressful. I don't know how to do it. Yes, totally understandable. Yeah, sure. Not sure if I'm doing the right thing. Responsibility, anxiety inducing. Okay, totally makes sense. So right now, from for the rest of this presentation, I want to try on a new context for you with managing money. And that context is, what if you started to see money management as self-care? You know, in the same category as taking a bath or sleeping or you know getting a massage like what are the the ways that you take care of yourself what if taking care of money were just one more piece of your self care routine you know i mean we put it on the essentials list in fact we put it above bathing because you know if you skip a shower your life's not going to fall apart but if you ignore your money for too long it could and so taking care of your money and really bringing this new mindset as if I take care of my money, my money takes care of me and really believing that and treating this as a completely different type of relationship because new results require a new relationship. So you remember Hannah and Madison, they had different relationships with money, which is what led to their different outcomes. And so what does this new relationship with money look like? You know, this is, it's up to you. You get to create your own relationship to money. For, it, for some, it could be, it could feel sacred and authentic and empowering. For others, you know, you can have your own, however you want to experience it. But one that treats managing money like self-care, like really believing that it's a, um, that's something that's supporting you. And so one way to do this, we'll talk about, um, there's, there are a lot of ways to do this, and I'll, I'll sprinkle one more in, but the main one we're going to talk about today is creating a pleasurable weekly money ritual that makes you actually want to deal with your finances. I know this is probably crazy, especially to all of you who wrote, you know, this is gut-wrenching, or this is anxiety-inducing, or tedious, you know, this is definitely a different shift of how you look at taking care of your finances, but it is possible. You know, I have seen thousands of women do this uh, and it's just really cool to see what's on the other side. So what we're gonna do is, you know, rewire your negative associations about dealing with money. So almost all of you wrote some negative phrase in the chat about how you currently 
uh, associate working, dealing with money. And this is really about shifting that. So, you know, you may think about money with just taking care of your bills or during tax seasons or uh, related to your debt. And instead, when you take care of your money on a weekly basis as part of your self-care routine, it becomes something that can be actually a really positive experience. And the more positive our associations with money can be, I mean, I don't know if you believe in um, manifestation, or, you know, any of those sorts of things, but the more positively we can believe in anything, the more good will come of it. So <clears throat> what is it? Let's just get super practical. What is a weekly money ritual? I know you're all wondering. So it is a, is a dedicated hour each week of financial self-care. It's time you set aside to focus on your finances, tackle those things on your to-do list. Most importantly, it's something, you do something that you enjoy while you do it, and then you reward yourself afterwards. So we're going to talk about how to enjoy it and how to reward yourself, um, and we're going to talk about, you know, what are the things that you could do during it. But I want to just focus on that first piece. So an hour a week on your money. Is there resistance coming up for you as I say that? Are you like, I, I can't make the time. I don't know how I'm going to fit it in. I'm already so busy. Like, I can't. Is that, is that coming up for anyone? Because if you are noticing that resistance, I want you, okay, no, great, great. You're all on board. This is amazing. <laughs> cool. Wow, I love it. Okay, we have so much commitment in the chat. Love it. Okay. Well, if there were resistance, one way to think about it, you know, because maybe there's excitement now, but there isn't excitement in a few weeks is that, um, you know, think about how many hours you spend a week working, you know, earning your money, working to get your money, and then how many hours you spend taking care of it. And given how much time you spend earning it, it only makes sense to, you know, spend at least an hour tending to it. We have a lot of people who start doing the hour and then they're like, I'm, you know, I'm loving this. I'm getting so into it. I'm going to stay for two hours. So feel free to give yourself a buffer, but an hour is, um, can be enough, at least when you're starting. Okay. So what to do during your weekly money ritual? I'm again, I'm going to give you a checklist. It's going to have a bunch of ideas for how to actually spend your time, but you know, one, there, here are a few ways. You can log into your accounts and review recent transactions. This is one that has provided, proven to be incredibly valuable for people because they find, you know, bogus charges and subscriptions that they didn't even know they had anymore and they cancel that. And so this is, a, that's one to just like find money is look at your accounts and look at your recent transactions. You can also start tracking your spending. So each week, sit down and say, like, what did I spend money on this week? And was it in alignment with what I care about? You could call and negotiate lower interest rates on your credit cards or get fees removed from your bank accounts. You know, that's it's just one of those to do list things that you probably are never going to do unless you sit down for your money ritual. You could set up auto savings or transfers if you're like, oh, I, I should probably have an auto transfer going into my retirement account or, you know, that 401k my employer offered that I never set up. Maybe I'll set that up. Um, you could also use this time to set financial goals. You know, what's my, what's my monthly income goal this month? Or, you know, what do I want to get my budget down to this month? All different ways to spend your money ritual. There's no shortage of ideas. Um, but whatever you end up doing during this time, the most important piece of this whole thing is that you make it pleasurable. And that's because we're shifting our mindset when it comes to money. So it's no longer just this, you know, this like homework type exercise. It's, it's a way that you are taking care of yourself and you're taking care of yourself in all of the senses. So, you know, is it playing music? Is it lighting a candle, making a really delicious hot beverage? Are you sitting in a comfortable place while you do it? Are you pouring a glass of wine? Are you pulling a tarot card before you start your ritual? You know, what are the ways that you can bring in your own self-care practices to this weekly money ritual? So this is, you know, you might be tempted to skip it. You know, I know those of you who are like, I'm going to go check all my accounts right now. If you do that, money is going to stay as this chore, negative thing. And so you really need to bring the pleasurable pieces into your ritual to reset your relationship, to really think about money positively. So a bonus exercise I want to give you, you know, if you wanted to take this a step further, 
would be to um, another way to shift to the positive mindset is write out your new identity when it comes to money. So who are you going to be with your finances going forward? I have a persona. Her name is Bountiful Brit. <laughs> she tracks her spending each week. She uses money to support causes that she cares about. You know, whatever your story is about who you want to be when it comes to money, write it out and have that be one of your weekly rituals where you're actually just writing out your new persona. Okay, so my challenge for you is to actually do this. So schedule it in your calendar for this next week. Try it once, see how it, happens. See how it goes for you. Make it pleasurable, don't skip that step. Follow the checklist, which I'm about to give you, and then reward yourself afterwards. So this part we haven't talked about yet, but this is equally important to all of it, is like, you know, you just spent an hour looking through each of your transactions. How are you going to really reward yourself for having done that, for having sat down and done it? Are you going to take a bath? Are you going to watch an episode of the super trashy show that you love and you feel guilty about watching? You know, can you watch that guilt-free? Can you get out the fancy chocolate or a glass of wine? Enjoy the glass of wine with all of the above. You know, really reward yourself. Make it worthwhile. Okay, so for the financial checklist, um, I think I can pop this. Oh, hold on. <coughs> okay, it's easy enough, but um, Nina, if you could put that in the chat, try.dowjanes.com forward slash ritual is where you can download your, you'll get a free weekly checklist. We'll email it to you, your inbox. Um, you just pop okay. your email. Try down James. I'm getting it now. I'll stick it in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Sydney. Sydney did it. Okay, great. Um, and in that will be tips for how to prepare for your weekly money ritual, creative ideas for how to make it pleasurable, a financial to-do list with suggestions for what you can do. Um, and if you do you know, nothing else to change your financial situation, just spending time on them, just starting to pay attention will make a difference. I love this. Abundance Anne. All, someone already has their money persona. <laughs> Abundance Anne is great. And a lot of what this reminds me of is, you know, the, it takes, what, what do they say? 21 days to form a habit. I mean, it's taken me a long time to have it. I used to, like a lot of people, I used to let the bills kind of pile up and I would look at them and think it was super stressful. And then every three weeks I would kind of go and deal with it and then feel so much more relieved when I was done. And now I just deal with it in a much more daily way. Kind of like what you're talking, like having it not being afraid of it and kind of digging into it has helped me shift my anxiety about money. Yes. Yeah. I love that. It really, it is about shifting anxiety. You know, I, for a long time, I've, I've had money anxiety. It's like a, a scarcity mindset. It's so common in all of us. And um, really just getting clear on the numbers, just knowing what they are, you know, knowing yeah. where money is, it's like, it's, it's peaceful. It's, it, it brings a lot of peace into my body when I just have clarity. Yeah. When you have clarity and when you also feel like anything, when you have agency, when you feel like you, you can actually see that you're making a difference, which of course is a bigger step, right? It's one thing to know what's going on and then to actually start to make changes in the right direction, but doing what you're describing. Like when I do, I have to say, I don't do it enough. When I sit down and go through my credit card statements and, you know, look to look for fraudulent charges or double charges or things that I didn't realize I was paying for. And as everyone has here said in the chat, I always find things. Yeah. Um, and then I feel so much more on top of things. Right. And it, it wasn't so scary. You just deal with it. You just look at it and you call and you, um, but there is something about the kind of, I think for a lot of us, there's that avoidant, like, I just don't want to deal with it. And that's a big hurdle to get over. Yeah. I mean, based on the, the incredible audience in the chat, you know, there's like, there's no resistance to sitting down and doing this. So, you know, you're on your way. I love it. That's great. All right. So do we have any particular questions from the audience? We've answered a few in the chat. You feel free to raise your hand. If you want to speak up, you can type in the Q and A, you can type in the chat. Um, I'm glad Anastasia, this is an outstanding presentation. I agree. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and maybe you can tell us, Britt, a little bit more about Dow Janes and how your business works. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to give, we have a super special offer today for the, for the all participants. So I'd love to share that. Please. Uh, yeah. And then we can go into all questions of all kinds after that. Um, so, you know, my question for you is if you don't want to do this alone, if you're like, you know, I, I feel super motivated in this moment, but I'm not sure I'm going to stick with it, or I want more support than just the checklist, you know, you know who you are, if that applies to you. And if so, 
we would love to support you. So the weekly money ritual is one of the cornerstones of our flagship program, the Million Dollar Year. And Million Dollar Year, you know, if you liked what you learned today and you want to improve your relationship to money, take control of your financial life, feel empowered when it comes to your finances and feel super confident about the systems that you have in place to take care of you, then I would highly suggest considering joining the Million Dollar Year. Um, so it is a year-long transformational program. We give you the education. So there's a curriculum that you walk through. There's support with coaches. There's accountability, text message, weekly accountability to actually help you build these habits. Because you know it's, it's one thing to want to do them. And then it's another to you know, really sit down and do them and to have, feel like someone is tracking you and that you're doing your ritual each week. Um, that's great. I have to say, I'm almost tempted to give this as a gift to one of my daughters or maybe all three of yes. my daughters. How much does it cost? Absolutely. Um, I have, I'll go into the pricing. It's a, it's an incredible discount for the revelers. Um, so I can jump straight through there. Um, basically here's what's included. I can answer more questions if you have them. There's the curriculum, there's accountability, um, and then there's workshops on various topics, you know, life insurance, real estate, investing, negotiations. So you essentially become kind of part of a, a club, really. How many women are, how many women do this right now? Yeah, right now we have about 3,000 women. In That's the a lot. That's so amazing. There's a super active um, Facebook community where everyone who's in the program is part of it. And so you really, you know, it's a place to talk about money and to feel like, you know, it's, you can go in and brag about your raise or you know, all these things that are taboo in most places. You get to just, you know, talk about the debt you paid off in, in the community. And what's your demographic typically in the community? It is, we have people who are, you know, range of ages. I would say our sweet spot is like 35 to 55, mm -hmm. um, but we have people as old as 70 um, and as young as 18. Wow. Okay. Sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah. And is, is this the main program you run? Do you also run like one-off workshops? This is, this is it. We do workshops for our members, um, mm -hmm. but not, we don't invite the public to those. It's just, we keep it really you know, tight. Got it. So what we were, what we got the opportunity to do today is just get your presentation, but it really is a, it's a club, essentially. It's learning a club, or I don't know what you call it, a community around really learning how to change your mindset toward money and learning new rituals, and new skills and having accountability. It sounds awesome. Yeah, and a big piece is the curriculum. You know, so it's a it's a twelve step curriculum that you walk through, kind of like as you would think an online course, mm -hmm. um, and that you know, teaches you everything about how to budget, how to prepare for retirement, how to invest. Uh, you know, each of the steps along the way in order. No, that's really helpful. And actually, Eva just made a comment saying she felt not so great signing up, knowing she wasn't in their demographic. I wonder what you mean, Eva. Did you do you mean that? you felt like you were too old or I'm curious because it sounds like um, the community is pretty much all ages, although it's true that Brit is in her mid thirties. Um, oh, that's about Revel. Oh, I see. Oh, Eva said that about Revel. Got it. I understand. Okay. never mind. You can, you're close. You're close to being able to join Revel. Yeah. You just have to be 40. <laughs> we don't mind women as long as you're like near 40. It's all good. Um, all right. So what is the price for the million dollar year? Cool. Let me jump into it. These are some common results. I mean, we, people, it's incredible, the results. I get testimonials every day about people who have you know, paid off debt, grown their net worth. It's just, it's remarkable to see. But I'll jump into what's included, the value. It's well worth more than $10,000, but we created this knowing we wanted to have an impact on as many women as possible. We wanted to make it affordable. Normally we sell it for 5,000. If you went to our website, that's what you would find is the million dollar year is 5,000. But today for revelers, we're doing 70% off. This is the lowest price we ever offer the million dollar year. So instead of um, $5,000, you can get access for 1499, 1,499 if you pay in full or 149 per month um, for 12 payments over the course of your million dollar year. You have access to the program for 12 months. Amazing. I would guess that the problem with one of these things is do people stick with it? Is it like a gym membership? What's your rate of attrition? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's why we have the weekly text message accountability. So once you're in the program, you get a text every week asking if you did your money ritual. Um, we have weekly calls where you can come on and ask questions. 
And you know, a lot of people who've been through the program, they they encourage new members to go through it more than more than once. They're like, there's so much in there, it's so dense, there's a ton of material. Go through it more than once. And so you're kind of incentivized to to work through it quickly so that you can start again from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we have so many questions. I've got questions in the chat about your program and then questions in the QA about just money in general. So I'm gonna do a few of each. Um, Questions about the program. Can you start at any time? Do you get lifetime access? Do you have yes. an accountability partner? Yes. Yeah, so tomorrow you can start anytime. Um, we know that with with things like financial wellness, you there's motivation. And then when it strikes, it strikes. And so we're not going to wait, make you wait till the next cohort. You can start whenever you are ready. Um, and Emma, you don't get lifetime access. We encourage you to really move through the program because that's how things actually happen. And so we give you a year of access. And then if you want to stay on, you can stay on for a discounted price after that. Mm -hmm. um, Vicki, the coaching is weekly calls um, that are led by financial coaches. And then there's coaching in the community as well, you know, answering questions. And if you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, you can add that. Um, but that one-on-one -on -one coaching does not come with this program. This program is a curriculum that you really, you have to do it yourself. We hold your hand in a lot of ways. You know, we break things down into bite-sized pieces, but you actually have, you have to, to, to be motivated. How many, how much time do you think it typically takes per week? You know, I would say two hours a week. So if there's, you know, an hour of doing your money ritual, okay. which you can do what we talked about here. A lot of people use their money ritual to go through the program to actually like go through the videos and the steps. Um, and so if you want to move quickly, you know, you can do it in an hour a week, but if you want to move faster, a lot of people end up, they just want to do more. So they do two hours a week. Right. Right. This has been so great, Britt. We're, we've gone longer than we usually do. Is it okay if we go to a few more questions? Do you mind? Of course. Not at all. Yeah. Um, and just to answer everyone's question in terms of the recording, this whole session is recorded both video and audio. So it'll be released as our podcast, which is called Raging Gracefully. You can look for that anywhere you find podcasts. You'll also be able to find it on the Revel YouTube page as a video, and you'll also find it as content in our site. It'll be this week in our newsletter, the video, and the podcast, so it's easily found. Um, what is your advice about negotiating for raises, um, lower rates, et cetera? I was curious about that. When you described Hannah and Madison, one of my daughters just went through trying to negotiate for a raise and didn't have any luck. Like They were offering her I think 46,000 and maybe she got up to 47, but she spent weeks kind of working at it. So I am curious, what is your advice about negotiating for raises? Yes. So the first thing I would say is that you're going to have the most luck and the most success over your lifetime. If you negotiate before you start the job, you know, you're just automatically starting at a higher point. So always negotiate with any new job, start there. Mm. And then if you're already in your job and then you're negotiating for a raise, what's really important is to have a record of your accomplishments. And by accomplishments, I mean ways that you've contributed to the value of the business, either to growth or to reducing costs or whatever, you know, ways that you have really contributed to the business, kind of proving your worth um, and go into that conversation. A raise is, the conversation doesn't happen once. It's not it doesn't happen in one meeting, it happens over time. And so you start the conversation by saying, you know, I'm really, I'm looking for, to increase my pay, you know, here's what I propose I work on over the next few months. If I achieve these things, you know, if we, what do you say to a $5,000 increase? You know, it's, you're working it out together. It's, a lot of people think a negotiation is just like a standoff, but really it's a, it's a collaboration. And so, that's you know, excellent bring, advice. Yeah, bringing as much information in as you can to both, you know, make your argument, but then work with the other person to see, you know, what makes sense for the business. They might, they might have a cap and they can't pay you any more than that. And at that point, you need to look for other jobs and getting right. that information, you know, early, you're better off. Really great. Um, a couple of questions about Bitcoin. Uh, I have debt and 1.3 Bitcoin. Do I sell some of the Bitcoin to get rid of debt? Um, I'm not sure about yeah. that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, <coughs> it's a lot of Bitcoin. Very impressive. Um, if so, the way that it works is that, you know, with you always want to think about it as interest rates. So if you have credit card debt and you're paying 25% in interest rate, 
Um, and then you have money sitting in a savings account where you're earning like a 0.5% interest rate. You are way better off using that money from savings to pay off your credit card debt than to just let it sit there because it's not doing anything for you in your savings account and you could be paying it off. You could not be paying 25% in interest. So the thing you want to think about with your Bitcoin is, are you making more than 25% a year? You know, whatever the amount, your interest rate on your credit card is, it could be 18, it could be 25. Are you making that with your Bitcoin investment? Um, I'm guessing with where Bitcoin is right now, it's probably not increasing at 25%. And so you would be better off uh, selling that and using it to pay off your debt. Mm, thank you. Great. Um, how do I start learning about investing is a question. And also, is your membership for men or only for women? Um, our membership, you know, legally, we cannot exclude anyone, but we try to create a community of people who identify as women or non-binary um, in the million dollar year. We do have a self-study program that does not come with community or coaching that's available. Um, we invite anyone to join that. It's called Money School. Money School. Okay, good to know. Um, there was also a question on the calls. There are on Mondays and the times rotate to accommodate different time zones. So it's at noon Pacific time and 4 p.m. Pacific time every other week. Um, how do I start learning about investing? That's kind of a big question. Yeah, that's a great question. So the thing I would say is that most people overcomplicate investing. So they think I need to you know, be analyzing PE ratios and like figure out what stocks I'm gonna pick. And the bottom line with investing is that, <laughs> hard to bottom line a topic that's very big, but you wanna think about diversification and asset allocation. Those are the two most important pieces. And diversification means investing in a lot of different things so that you aren't, um, you aren't overly dependent on one thing. And so to do that, a really good way to get invested is with a low cost index fund. Um, you can Google that. There's lots of different types. Um, so that's a great way to get diversification. Asset allocation is referring to how much of your portfolio is stocks versus bonds. And that depends on your age. Um, there's I could teach a whole nother session on this, but basically stocks are riskier, bonds are slightly safer. And so if you're getting closer to retirement, you want to have a more weighted, you know, 50-50 allocation of stocks and bonds. If you're like 30 and just getting started, you want to go 100% stocks. Mm -hmm. So those are you know, important things to know as you're going into investing. Another really important thing to know is that you are not ready to invest until you have paid off all of your high interest rate debt. That's any debt over 7%. And you have a fully funded emergency fund, meaning you know, three to six months of savings sitting in an easily accessible account. You have to have those two things in place before you're ready to invest. No Reason debt in an emergency fund. No high risk, high, high interest. No high interest rate debt. Yeah. Yeah. Makes total yeah. sense. It does. It does when you think about it, when you like realize that investing is inherently risky and the value goes up and down over time. And so, you know, the way you lose money by investing is taking your money out. Mm -hmm. And so if instead you can just wait it out and let it stay invested longer. You, you know, you'll rarely lose money in that case. Yeah. Um, do you recommend using automated investing platforms like Wealth Simple or Quest Trade? They can be great. It sounds like you might be in Canada. Um, those, oh, and there was a question about if it works for Canadians. It does. Yeah. So it's, you know, 95% of the curriculum is universally applicable. And then we do have specific recommendations for Canada, Australia, the UK, and the US. Um, so, yes. Um, as for platforms, pay attention to the fees. So there, this is a sticking point for me because a lot of these platforms will charge, um, they'll either charge a monthly fee. So they'll charge like a dollar a month, which sounds so low. And then when you actually look at how much you're investing, you know, a lot of people are just getting started with like a couple thousand dollars. You end up paying, you know, an exorbitant amount in fees. The, mm -hmm. the golden number that you want to look for is don't pay more than 0.3% in fees. These fees can come in different ways. There's either the, the fee of the platform. There's also expense ratios, which are the fee that is on top of a fund that you invest in. Um, so really pay attention to those fees because that can eat up a lot of your earnings. Yeah, which again speaks to kind of what we were talking about. I mean, the whole idea of like take getting your head out of the sand and be, being really willing to look at exactly what you have and exactly what you're paying and fees. And I just think sometimes paying attention to the whole thing can be overwhelming. So 
Is Can be, yeah. yeah. Um, someone wants to know if her 13 year old could do this program with you. Um, I mean, if she's doing it with a parent, totally. It's probably a bit, you know, the material is not designed for a 13 year old. Um, if she's like very mature, she oh, might be anxious. Right. Um, but you could also just share, you know, what you're learning, share the pieces of it with your 13 year old. I will direct you to, um, we have a YouTube video called, um, I think the, the thumbnails says like raise rich kids or something but it's a, about teaching your kids about personal finance. And it's, um, it, I talk through the, the thing that my dad taught us growing up, which was called the daddy bank and how to invest and earn, earn interest and what compound interest is. And so Kayla, check out that video on YouTube. All right, and I'm gonna now let you continue with your presentation because we're definitely, we've run pretty late. This has been so fantastic, Britt. So I'm gonna let you wrap up, but we love it. This is Yeah, great. no, I think that's it. I mean, the only last thing I was gonna share was just this, you know, if you're wondering what's it, if it's possible for you to have these results, um, I wanna assure that, you know, if you follow the steps in the program, what you will achieve is remarkable. You know, we offer a double your investment money back guarantee. So if you don't make wow. whatever you invest in the program, and in this case, as a reveler, you know, $14.99, if you don't double that, so you've either increased your net worth by 3000 or you've paid off $3,000 worth of debt, uh, we give you a full refund. So after a year of, you know, complete working through the curriculum. So yeah. it's guaranteed the results are incredible. Um, if you have other questions, um, do, 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 do. yeah, I, just to go on Catherine for a minute, this piece about I'm not wasting time anymore. This one, this really stuck out to me because often with your finances, you don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. And with the million dollar year, it's step by step. We show you exactly you know, what to be working on when, the importance of a roadmap and doing things in the right order. And so just, you know, feeling like you're not wasting time anymore when you get started. It really seems like an incredible program. I'm very, very <laughs> impressed. Like and all your answers to everything were right on. And yeah, it's just fabulous. I am really going to talk to my three daughters and see if anyone is serious enough about wanting to do this and sign them up because I think Amazing. it's really, really impressive. Um, so to the audience, thank you so much. So the code, the discount code is REVEL. It's DowJanes.com. Um, where can you find out about money school? Good question. Where can we find out about money school? We don't offer money school publicly. So, um, email hello at dowjans.com. And I will say, Sherry, that, you know, it's very standalone. So there's, you know, there's no community, there's no accountability, there's no support. So just to be really clear about what that is. Uh, um, and yes, your family can use it, use the discount code. You could even give it to your friends if you want it. It's, it's fun to have someone in the program doing it with you. You know, it really helps. We do assign people, we don't assign, but we invite you to find accountability buddies when you start. And yeah. if you put a friend in on the, in the program with you, it can just be, you know, so much more fun to just have someone to do your money ritual with. That makes a lot of sense, actually. That would be really fun. I love that idea. This is great, Britt, really incredibly generous with your time and information and the presentation was fabulous. And thank you to all of our lovely participants. Please um, anytime email me, Nina at Hello Revel, if you have any questions, comments, ideas for new sessions and sign up for Revel and check out our events. It's lovely to see everyone. Thank you so much, Nina. This was so fun. Love right. the engagement in the chat. Thank you all for being here. Really nice. Yeah, to really good group. All right, we'll talk more soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.